In today's episode, we try and solve a scriptural problem that's plagued theologians and biblical scholars for millennia. Now on the docket is the strange case of Luke chapter 4, verse 23. The latest news, history, and analysis from the perspective of the first Christians. Tune into the FBN Worldwide 24-7 radio stream. Now your host, Darren Kalama. FBN recently did an episode that grappled with an overlooked verse in John 7:42 that highlighted a monumental problem with the Bethlehem birth story and the narrative about Jesus having a Jewish background. The response from viewers was pretty overwhelming. Now, I use overwhelming in a relative sense because we're such a tiny network with a very niche audience. You could probably post a video of moss growing on a rock with time-lapse photography on YouTube and get more views than we do. But the viewers we do have are pretty focused and dedicated, and one of the things we recommend to other people that follow the pre-Nicene faith and use the first Christian Bible of 144 AD is to always seek the truth. And it spawned kind of a cottage industry where people will take that first Bible and see for themselves the changes that were made, the editing that was done to it when they compare those original verses to the modern Bible, the Judeo-Christian Bible, the King James Version that everyone uses today. Anyway, as a result, we had a lot of viewer mail about Luke chapter 4, verse 23. Some sharp-eyed people notice that the verse doesn't make any sense. It has Jesus referring to places using the wrong timeline of events. But really what it is is just amateurish plagiarism and bad editing. But let's read it together and see what all the hubbub is about. Quote, and he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, Heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. Unquote. Even for casual readers of the Bible, there's a glaring error, because in the next few sentences we find out that Jesus hadn't even been to Capernaum yet. Fast forward to verse 30, right after the Jews try to kill Jesus when he's in Nazareth by throwing him off of a cliff. Here we go, verse 30, just a few sentences after verse 23. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way, and came down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Wait a minute, what? How did that happen? Jesus just got done telling the Jews in Nazareth that he knows they want to see him do the same miracles that he did in Capernaum. Let's read it again. Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. But a few sentences later, we find out that he had never been in Capernaum. He was on his way to Capernaum, as we just read here. And came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Now, obviously, it's a screw-up. It's a major screw-up. If this was a Hollywood script, they would have to reshoot the whole scene. And maybe in a strange way, it is a Hollywood scene, or maybe a little closer to a crime scene. Now, before I get into this and really dissect it, you have to know that this screw-up has been the subject of intense explanations for hundreds of years as the Judaizers tried to patch it up with a series of word games, semantics, and linguistic gymnastics, all of which make no sense and really are just pretty embarrassing. In fact, biblical scholars and theologians have made career moves out of trying to fix these errors, even to this day. It's a never-ending list of problems that just roll on and on. You see, Luke 4.23 is just one of dozens of glaring problems in the Synoptic Gospels. Out of all of them, the episode we did on John 7.42 and the Jesus birth story is probably the most damning. 
By comparison, Luke 4.23 is just lazy editing and half-stepping plagiarization. The John episode was titled Stolen Divinity in the Magic Bullet of Bethlehem, and if you haven't watched it, I suggest you check it out because it also covers a lot of the basics and backstory behind why some of these mistakes were simply inevitable. And I say inevitable for a few reasons, because there's no such thing as a perfect crime, and mistakes are inevitable with every crime. And what we have here is a massive crime scene and cover-up, a conspiracy so vast it makes the fake plague we just went through look like some kid lying about his dog eating his homework. And it's interesting, is it not, that we find the same criminals from 2,000 years ago hard at work today, don't we? If you don't think they're capable of doing what I'm about to explain to you, you're pretty gullible, and there's really no other way to say it. But you have plenty of company. But don't worry, it won't last much longer. For now, just reflect on a verse from an epistle you might be familiar with. It's from 1 Thessalonians 2.15, in which these criminals are described as, quote, the enemy of all mankind that displease God himself, unquote. Mind you, not just one, not just some of them, all of them, the whole group. And yes, they're capable of anything, including about what we're about to go over. And there's nothing new about it, although if you're hearing this for the first time, it's going to be a little jarring, as the truth usually is. You see, they didn't just kill Christ. They attempted to steal his divinity. They hijacked Christianity itself. Let that sink in. Now, I told you it was a massive crime scene, and the cover-up was even bigger. But to understand how big, we need to start with a foundation of truth, the simple basics, free of confusion. You see, there is but one God, our Christian God, and he revealed himself to us only when he sent his son Jesus Christ to us. Nobody knew God prior to the arrival of his son. Nobody. Not the Greeks, not the Romans, the Jews, the Hindus, the Chinese, the Egyptians. Nobody. 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 3 gives us the big picture, and here it is. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him, unquote. Any person or group of people that tells you different from that is a liar, and you can quote me. You see, Jesus transcends race and religion. He didn't play favorites with one group over another, period. When he arrived, it was a clean slate all across the board for everybody. Now, if you understand what I just told you, congratulations, because it just eliminated about 70% of the confusion and nonsense that has been ingrained in you since birth concerning God and Christ. But what about after he arrived to teach us and let us know God loved us all? We weren't there. How can, how can we be sure of what he said and what he taught? Should we just take the word of four or five anonymous authors with different stories and confusing timelines? No. This is not something God would leave to chance. Which brings us to the Gospels, or rather, THE Gospel, singular, the Gospel of the Lord. You may know it as the Apostle Paul's revelation that he had on the road to Damascus. What it was, was Jesus Christ searing into his brain and soul the gospel that he wanted all of us to hear. The gospel in which Paul says, quote, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ, unquote. And of course, we find that in Galatians 1, 8-9. So yes, that one, that gospel, a message so powerful he was driven to establish Christian churches across the known world with it. You see, he wasn't preaching Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. He was preaching the gospel of the Lord, every jot and tittle given to him directly by Christ. And from that gospel, we learn how Jesus arrived, when Jesus arrived, what he said, what he did, and how he left. 
Now, you might be saying, whoa, wait a minute, Darren. I've got a Bible right here, and there's nothing called the gospel of the Lord in here. What's going on here? What is this witchcraft? What's the story, Darren? And, well, you'd be right, or rather, kind of right. You see, bits and pieces of the gospel of the Lord are still in your modern Judeo-Christian Bible, well, at least in the New Testament section of it. Most of it has been edited, redacted, reworded, and Judaized to the point that it's virtually unrecognizable. You have to know what the original parts look like to be able to discern what was later added and changed. Now, of course, even better would be to have a copy of the Gospel of the Lord, and with it you'd be able to see exactly what was changed and edited, kind of like what I'm doing right now with my copy. You see, I have the original Christian Bible of 144 AD, and that means I have the original Gospel of the Lord along with Paul's original ten epistles. Oh, and the epistles? Yeah, they changed those too. Now, before we get into why they made all the changes, I figure now is as good a time as any to take another look at that Luke 4.23 again. I mean, maybe some of the bits and pieces of the original Gospel of the Lord are in there somewhere. I mean, that would be something, wouldn't it? Maybe a stray word or two. Who knows? It couldn't hurt to check, I reckon. No need to get all fancy about it. Let's just open her up to page one. Start right at the beginning and see what's what. And it begins. In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Jesus descended into Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was in authority. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we done with you, Jesus? Are you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold your peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. And he came to Nazareth, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and sat down. And he began to speak to them, and all wondered at the words which proceeded out of his mouth. And he said unto them, you will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, Heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Oh my, that sure sounded familiar, didn't it? Well, there you have it. It looks like our buddy Luke just copy-pasted from the original Gospel of the Lord and then put the Nazareth visit in front of Capernaum. He even copied the physician heal thyself line word for word. But was it just a simple mistake or was there a reason? Well, what reason? Now, I think I have a pretty good idea about why he did it, and you might as well. But to get there, we need a little bit more context. And that starts with asking, who was this Luke guy anyway? It seems it would be a pretty important question. After all, the Catholic Church is ascribing his writings to be the very word of God. Let that sink in. This guy must be pretty important. I mean, at least an apostle or something. Spent time with Jesus and knew what happened. I mean, he had to have been a real insider. Well, no. According to the church, the Gospel of Luke, and all the Gospels for that matter, including Acts, were written by four or five anonymous authors. That's their official position. Don't ask, don't tell, it's the Word of God. Divinely inspired, but we have no idea who any of these people are. Well, that sure gives the church a lot of wiggle room, a lot of plausible deniability. It's the Word of God, but we're not obligated to prove it or even tell you who wrote it. Yeah, see how far that would fly in a courtroom. Now, that's the official position, but unofficially, the general consensus is that Luke is actually pretty well known as being, well, Luke. 
Luke, the traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. Luke was also a physician. Now, we know that part is true because Paul tells us about Luke in his original epistles. Now, because we're investigating this as a crime scene with suspects, let's focus in on a couple key details and facts. Number one, Luke was not an apostle. Number two, Luke never met Jesus. And number three, all of Luke's accounts were acquired second or third hand, as he tells us himself. Now, already our suspect is looking pretty shady, wouldn't you say? But there's more. You see, Luke spent time traveling with the Apostle Paul, helping him preach the original gospel of the Lord. And common sense tells us he would have had access to everything in that gospel and been able to question Paul about it thoroughly. He probably made his own copy of it. And what does Luke do right after traveling with the Apostle Paul? Well, you guessed it. He pumped out his own gospel, his own version of the real gospel. Now, it's pretty obvious what happened, and we've shown unassailable examples of the plagiarism and the amateur cut-and-paste job he did. And there's literally dozens more examples. If Luke was smart, he should lawyer up right about now and just end the interview. But the problem is, he would have asked for a lawyer in Greek, the same language his gospel was written in, and I don't understand Greek. So we're going to go ahead and just keep this interview rolling. You see, with a crime, we like to cover three things, means, motive, and opportunity. We nailed down means and opportunity, but that still leaves motive. Luke, buddy, we know you did it. The cat's out of the bag. That part's over. We just want to know why you did it. Give everyone some closure. Things will go better for you. Just tell us why you did it. Now, the answer to this question unlocks everything, and the importance of knowing why, knowing the motivation, cannot be overstated. Because it's not just Luke. There are three synoptic Gospels that all did the same thing, that all used the original Gospel and then changed it. There is a conspiracy. There's no question. But why? Now, this is where it gets fairly interesting. Regular viewers and listeners, I'm assuming, already have a free copy of the very first Bible in ebook format or bought a hard copy so that they can follow along as we get deeper into the weeds here. If you're new, just type four words into any browser, the very first Bible, or go to theveryfirstbible.org.org and download a free copy so you don't get lost on this next part. Only with a copy of the original gospel and original ten epistles will you be able to see exactly what they did. And by the way, we do these episodes in podcast audio format and in video. But video, I think, will be best on this one because of the side-by-side -side comparisons. But I'll do my best to explain it also for listeners so that it's at least uh, partially coherent. Anyway, back to our motive. But Luke isn't talking anymore because his lawyer just showed up. Now, we need to go back and find what triggered the event. There must have been a conflict. There had to have been. Who would want to rewrite and change the gospel of the Lord? What were they looking to gain? Qui bono? Who benefits from such a thing? And certainly, given the gravity of the changes involved, e.g., the very word of God and divinity of Christ— Somebody must have objected. Somebody had to have said something. Now, to find out, we need to sit down and review what we know before it was changed. Paul's revelation on the road to Damascus happened in 34 AD. That puts the earliest dating of the Gospel of the Lord at 34 AD. And what does Paul do with this revelation and new Gospel? Well, he tells us in Galatians 1, 12 through 14. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Cephas and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. 
Now, by the way, Cephas is Peter, and the part about the brother isn't meant in the familial sense, so don't get too hung up on that. Now, this two-week visit with Peter and James is an important part of the timeline that we're establishing because it means the earliest any of the other apostles would have known about the gospel of the Lord would have been in 37 AD. And in 37 AD, there was only one gospel, the gospel of the Lord. Nothing else existed. There was no Matthew. There was no Mark, no Luke, no John, and no Acts at that time only one gospel. And this is the time that the Judaizers and Ebionites had elevated James to cult icon status, even going so far as proclaiming him the real head of the church, not Peter. These were messianic Jews that were blending oil and water, Kabbalah wizards and alchemists, and proclaiming Jesus as a descendant from the line of David and pronouncing him to be the Jewish Messiah. Now, I don't think it's possible to actually overstate what a dire situation it was for Christianity at this time. In 37 AD, Christianity was effectively dead in the water. All the other apostles had been murdered or were on the run in hiding, and Peter and James were neck deep in Jews and Ebionites. In fact, Peter and James were de facto practicing Jews at that point and fully adherent to the 613 Torah laws as they lived right smack dab in the middle of Jerusalem, right next to the temple. Christianity was as empty as the tomb that had once held the body of Jesus, and the Judaizers were well on their way to hijacking the divinity of Christ and subverting the faith. And making matters worse? they now would have known about the gospel of the Lord. Paul was with Peter and James for two weeks, and I'm sure the subject came up. In fact, it's probably all they talked about. And that means they would have known the gospel begins with the words, and I quote, in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Jesus descended into Capernaum, a city in Galilee and was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was in authority. That's right, nothing about two Jews in a horse stable in Bethlehem, just Jesus descending from heaven to earth, specifically into Capernaum, coming to earth the same way he left it, ascending and descending. Nothing about King David and Solomon and mysterious bloodlines, Torah laws, and confusing Jewish lineage and fulfilling this or that prophecy on this or that moon cycle and him being the Jewish Messiah. No, none of that. Nada. It's very simple, clear-cut, and direct, as it should be. Because we're reminded in 1 Corinthians 14.33 that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And this truth represented a huge problem for the Ebionites and Judaizers that were surrounding James and Peter. You see, it's hard to fabricate a Jewish Messiah out of thin air if the very first sentence of the Gospel of the Lord refutes your entire narrative. It's hard to appropriate and hijack the divinity of the Son of God when your script just blew up in your face. Now, on top of that, you've killed Jesus and murdered some of his apostles. Talk about bad optics. Not to mention the fact that Jesus himself said your father is the devil and that you don't know God and God doesn't know you. The Jews were going to need a lot more than a public relations firm to fix a problem this large. And that, my friends, is where the synoptic gospels come into play. They are the competing narrative, the make Jesus a Jew at any cost game plan. The anonymous authors of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, with their carefully crafted editing and magic carpet weaving, desperately trying to staple their Torah onto Jesus Christ, just as they nailed his hands and feet to the cross. Incidentally, when one compares the synoptic parallels, some startling results are noticed. 
Of Mark's 11,025 words, only 132 have no parallel in either Matthew or Luke. Percentage-wise, 97% of Mark's gospel is duplicated in Matthew, and 88% is found in Luke. You see, it's a coordinated, top-down effort. There's nothing independent about them. And the only thing about them that's actually divinely inspired are the remaining unedited sentences that they plagiarize from the gospel of the Lord. In the end, a confusing, conflicted, and bizarre patchwork of disjointed nonsense and linguistic gymnastics fueled by reprobate imaginations and driven by Satan himself. It's the predictable failed result of stapling two different religions together. Complete chaos. Now, are you starting to understand why all the authors were anonymous? Remember how we got here? We were talking about the motive behind changing the gospel of the Lord and Luke's screw-up. Remember? Means, motive, opportunity. And Paul knew what they were doing. He knew all about their false gospels. He knew about their Judaizing and subversive tactics and trying to trick Christians into becoming slaves again under Jewish law. What do you think his epistles were all about? Look at them. Open your eyes. Here, literally, the first words from chapter 1 of Galatians. I marvel that ye are so quickly changed from him that called you in the grace unto a different gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel should announce to you a gospel contrary to what ye have received, let him be accursed. That's right. He knew all about these backroom serpents. Again, here, 2 Corinthians 6, 4-7. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. You see, this war with the enemy of all mankind, as Paul describes them, the Judaizers, would come to a head a short time later at the Council of Jerusalem in 48 AD. If you're interested in learning more about how that situation developed, I'll have links in the show notes for earlier episodes we've done on this very interesting subject. Theologians and authors like von Harnack, Badoon, Lousy, Kauchaud, Schwegler, Vincent, Lampe, Beinert, and Bauer also have useful information. But for the 30,000-foot view of how it all fits together, there's simply no substitute for Bishop Theophilus at the Marcionite Christian Church. And according to Theophilus, Christians need Judaism like a fish needs a bicycle. And he's fond of quoting 1 Corinthians 10.18. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Unquote. Now these are words we can certainly apply to our situation today, I would imagine. Remember, as Christians, we're compelled to always seek the truth and hold fast to it. And the first step is getting a free copy of the First Christian Bible. See for yourself and make your own judgment. You can get that at theveryfirstbible.org.org. Now, I think we'll wrap it up for today. And by the way, that first sentence from the first gospel about Jesus descending from heaven in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, well, that would be the year 29 AD. And the only historical major celestial event in that era happened that same year on November 24th at 11.05 a.m. That's when a total solar eclipse was 100% visible only if you were standing in one special spot on earth and nowhere else. And that special spot was a little town in Palestine called Capernaum. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm Darren Kalama. We'll see you next time on FBN First News.